We can get started. Um, good morning. My name is Angela Baldwin, and I am the host of Having the Hard Conversations. I wanted to give you a little bit of background on me. I'm a mother of two millennials and a Gen Z. Um, I'm also a Christian. I vote, but I didn't start voting, honestly, until I was 30 years old, because I, I believed at that time that just as I had the right to vote, I had the right not to vote. Um, I really wasn't educated in voting. We didn't really learn about it. It's just something that you did. Um, but then I did start voting. Um, I voted the party that my family, uh, all of my family believed in. Um, and during that time, and I had to learn that I needed to vote for the right people. So I have voted across party lines before, and I'm just giving information about me um, because I just, I believe in voting for the right person. And sometimes as we'll probably talk about, it might be the lesser of two evils. Um, additionally, I don't agree with the riots, um, but I do agree with the protest. I don't agree with looting um, because I really think it's crazy to tear up your own town, but I do understand that people are angry. My co-host today is my daughter, Aja. 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 <laughs> I wasn't gonna say your name, go ahead. Uh Oh, uh, well, I'm Aja. Um, I'm currently 28 and I'm the mom of I have a Gen Z and a Gen Alpha. Um, right, right now, my youngest is a Gen Alpha. Um, I myself am a millennial, like she said. Um, honestly, I didn't vote into the most recent um, election, which was the worst thing to what? Oh, I didn't vote until the most recent election. Um, I really never got into politics. Um, it really just wasn't my thing. But now, especially with everything going on, especially within the most recent years, um, I'm definitely starting to research and understand. Um, you know, right now, I'm really passionate about this systematic you know, racism that we have going on right now and really trying to find a resolution. And so... Um, I'm really excited to be on this call and be in this chat so that we can come up with a resolution um, and really get things, you know, moving for the Black community and, you know, pushing forward for justice for us. And so Ms. Dot is in now. Okay. Go ahead, keep going. Oh, and so right now, um, like she mentioned earlier, the panelists that we have are have Ms. Dot. Um, are a mix between our baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z community. Um, we have activists, uh, police officers, pastors, um, different races and ethnicities, and religions. Um, and so thank you all for participating and being willing to speak up and speak out and, you know, really represent not just who you are, but, you know, come in and, you know, speak on the injustices that are being done right now. We have more people coming in. <laughs> um, and so, you know, thank you for being here and being here for part one of having the hard conversations and on the pandemic of racism. As we've talked about, this is the first of four parts of the uh, conversation um, of the pandem pandemic of racism. What does that mean? Um, pandem pandemics happen when a virus, and in this case, we're talking about racism, emerges to infect people. The problem is that this particular pandemic has lasted for far too long. This conversation was created to start coming up with solutions and to deal with racism. We're also wanting to create and implement blueprint strategies that, that can and will be followed, not just within this group, but for every place that's dealing with racism. racism. And we know that that pretty much is everywhere. Um, we're not going to have all the answers in this group, but I'm a firm believer that it will take everyone to beat this pandemic to beat it back to the hell that it came from. So in the midst of all of us who are on the call, we do have individuals joining us from Facebook Live and Zoom. So thank you guys for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking the time to listen to the conversation. So we're about to get started. And so, you know, talking about the issue, um, you know, we all have feelings about it, um, deep feelings. And so panelists, can a couple of you really share how you're feeling right now, especially with everything going on? Okay, I'll start. So I'm, I'm frustrated. Anyway, don't everybody jump. <laughs> Um, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, 
Um, I'm tired. Um, I'm disillusioned with the system. Um, I really feel like, you know, this has become something that goes by the wayside after after a couple of weeks. You know, I, I feel like, you know, what, what, we, what we've done so far, all the strategies that were implemented just aren't working. And I really feel like we need to, like your attempt to do, formulate a strategy, but I think that we need to be on code. I, I, I really think we need to have a closed door policy or a closed door meeting where just black people are there because we need to fix issues with, within our own community. And I think a lot of times we invite other people into the conversation. And when we do that, you know, things get kind of discombobulated and then there's no, there's no set agenda that becomes for all people or for most people or whatever. So I think we need to start having meetings that, that, that represent just us and our needs. Anyone else? I'll chime in. <laughs> And, and so for me, I think, um, well, it's been a very emotional time. And I think personally, this has, and if, if you, anyone follows me on Facebook or is my friend know this is traumatic for me because um, last September, my cousin was shot and killed, murdered by several police officers. And so when this incident occurred, it just really um, took me back. And I think many of us are traumatized. I think many of us have dealt with generational trauma from um, this uh, systemic racism. And so for me is what do we need to do now, right? And like Angela said, we have had many conversations. And so when things happen, we voice our opinions and then it dies down because everyone goes back to work. So one great thing of having this COVID is that we are all in place and I think we're paying even more attention to things. And so we have to use this moment very wisely. And I do agree that we should have separate conversations by ourselves, but I also know that we need our allies. We need our white men and women to use their white privileges because I truly believe we cannot. And it's unfortunate, but we cannot do it by her ourselves. We need their power and we need their influence. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll chime in. So um, with that said, I, you know, I'm not in a war, you're going to have allies. That's understood. But my thing is, you know, they can go to their own people and have and have conversations with them, too. You know, they don't necessarily need to be included in, in our separate conversation. So, you know, I think, you know, I see a lot of, you know, I think it's kind of becoming trendy. I think it's kind of becoming trendy. A little bit. I saw my sister posted something where you know white women are, are cutting their hair or whatever. I think it's becoming a trend, and that's what I'm saying. Like I feel like the energy's shifting, and I feel like you know, after a while, if there's nothing uh, effective quickly, it's going to kind of be disillusioned. It's going to go away, like it has every other time. So I think like you know, I think we need to have separate conversations amongst the races. Like you know, the whites can talk to the whites, the Mexicans can talk to the Mexicans, the blacks can talk to the blacks, and then when we fix our own issues within our own community then maybe we can come and kind of ally and all of that. Um, I think what, um, I'm sorry, go ahead, whatever. Oh, I'm sorry. I Is think everybody hearing uh, Andre go in and out? No. 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 Wait, so if, can everybody hear Andre or no? Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to see yes. whose Wi-Fi it is. Yes, we can hear. Okay, thank you. I guess for me, um, I'm kind of torn between that. Um, I think I understand what what he's saying because I've always made comments that some some conversations um, should be left, you know, in in house kind of kind of like your family. Um, you don't discuss all of your family business, you know, out in public. You know, I have a different love for my my mom, my sister, my cousins than maybe someone else would. So if I have a conversation with something that they're doing, I might want to address that, you know, in the family living room versus putting that out in the street for everyone. So I'm kind of torn between that thought. I don't know. I, in a way, I feel like we're so far gone in America where we can't have that anymore because there, so many people are affected 
um, I just had a, a, a sorority sister of mine who is Caucasian and she's married to a black man and her son was in Zion um, at the park and someone called the police and said that, um, you know, they thought that some, there was some uh, criminal behavior. And when the cop showed up, there were a lot of white people in the park, but he went up to her son. So that bothered her and that scared her. And she's a, a, a white woman with a son that's, that's mixed, that looks, if you look at him, he doesn't look mixed, he looks black. So, you know, these are issues that affect everybody. And so she would want to be in that conversation that's in the living room as well, because she's just as afraid of her son as a, as a, 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 a black mom with a black son. So I don't know, I, I, that's why I'm torn. I do understand what you're saying though, because I do believe that people speak differently when there are other races around. Um, we've been trained and conditioned as much as black people don't want to admit it. We have what we call our white voice. <laughs> and then we have what we call our, our hood voice. You know, oh. we speak different when we when we around our people. And then when we go out and, and we're in public or whatever, we say, well, you can't really talk like that because you might start scaring folks if you start speaking oh. like you do when you're at home. So I do understand it. I'm torn between it. And I think that was one of the reasons why this is such a big issue um, with our races. I think police brutality is it's, it's crossed. I mean, we just saw that the, the senior man get knocked down with blood coming out of his ear. So I think everybody's feeling this. And I think everybody's is hitting too close to home for us to, to discuss police brutality among ourselves. Maybe other issues, I agree with you, brother. <laughs> but maybe this one, nah, they, everybody got to be in on this conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll echo that, Cam. You know, being in an interracial relationship, that you know, it does affect um, my white husband. Um, but even further than that, we cannot um, have the conversation alone because we didn't start the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so we we That's need true. to have the conversations with those who decided that we are not the same, that we are different, and because my skin is darker than yours, that there is a problem, and even the problem within our black community that I am a lighter shape than Angela or somebody else that there's a problem that there should be a problem between Angela and I we didn't create that that was created generations before us not by our black people but by you know um other races and so how can we solve the problem if we don't bring them in to say this is how we feel and this is how we want to be treated and I've heard many um echoes of they should go research it themselves and find solutions. But but Google can't tell you tell anyone how to treat Cynthia. Google can't tell anyone how to treat Angela um, or Aja or anyone on Andre. You know because even though we are all black people, we we all have different experiences and we all need to be a part of that conversation so people know what what is needed to be done. I do want to say that I think that there does come to a point where self-education, you have to take initiative to self-educate yourself on these issues so that way you can be productive in the conversation. I shouldn't have to sit here and instruct or educate you about simple things. So I think there does have to have, has to be some type of accountability to educate yourself so you can be productive and change in the conversation that we have. Um, there's so many books and resources out there for people to read, including our own Black people. I think Black people need to educate themselves. What's been distributed to us in our school system has not been true. It's been a different version of events. So I think there's a self-education that needs to go all the way around. Everyone needs to be come from an enlightened place where they can actually speak productively on how we can affect change that will actually be affected. So I think there is a point where everyone does need to come to the table with like um, some form of like what's going on. I shouldn't have to um, re-educate you. I agree. And with that said, um, Cynthia, you were saying that, you know, you say you're in an interracial, interracial relationship. No, my thing is, is this, I mean, that's fine. That's, that's your thing. My thing is this, it's like, you know, one thing that black people don't have in this country is an agenda. We don't have a black agenda. 
no candidate. Mm-hmm. People say, go out and vote. Well, go vote, go vote, go vote. We keep voting for people that don't even talk to us like we like we matter. You know, they're, they're very condescending. They dismiss us, you know, um, they deflect a lot. So I'm saying, I think the in-house conversation should have, we should come up with some kind of agenda for us specifically. Exactly. Because I went, through, I went through eight years of an Obama presidency where I saw him give concessions to certain marginalized groups, but he didn't give us anything. So my thing is with that closed door conversation that we definitely need to have, I think we need to come up with an agenda and personally being a black man, being a black person, I don't, I don't want anybody else in the room discussing an agenda for me. Maybe if we come up with an agenda first, then we can go out and have these, these, these you know, discussions, these town hall meetings with everybody else. But I think we need to get us together first. I think that's a really good point uh, of having an agenda. That, that's very important. But what, what will that look like? Uh, again, I, I think that we we call for conversations. These all conversations, the all conversations it doesn't take us that that far along to go back and take a look at agendas. The agenda hasn't changed. We're still fighting for the same things that we were fighting for 50 and 60 years ago when I was first born. We're fighting for the exact same things. So if we go back and we look at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we look at the NAACP, we look at the Urban League, we look at the things that they discussed then, though our agenda really hasn't changed much in the last 60 years. The conversations have already know what the issues are in our community. Now it's time to take action, meeting, discussing, and doing it all over again. I don't think it's I, I, I have a, a 11-year-old son who I had to sit down talk about this situation with him in a long-term conversation. And I decided to post that on Facebook Live so that others can see how we have issues, not in a discussion type of way, but in reality. I have a company where there's 350 people in the building and I'm only one of two blacks. You know, there's things that we, that, that discuss and get us, we've got all that, we've done all that. It's time for action. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, there was an agenda that was placed that I read from 1972, and we haven't crossed anything out from that agenda in 1972. It was really like gain political power, get economic wealth within our communities. Like we haven't even done those basic things. So I think you're right, Andre. But we we can. I think you're right in um, so that we can. Um, this is the time to demand something from our politicians. This is the time to actually get our, our agenda out there. I think we just have to pull from what we already have and then begin to demand that. And I think that's what um, a lot of people have been doing. Like, okay, Biden, you, you think you're gonna get this vote from us, but right now is the time where we can demand what we need from you. So that way, that way we know you get into office that you can actually advocate for us. Okay, there. So I have- Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? So I have a question um, because that's the thing that's been coming up in terms of voting specifically. Um, I know Andre has been very clear on talking about um, voting for, for lack of better words, the, the right person that will be, that will help us. But how do we get to that point? Um, in situations like this. For example, um, there's only two presidential nominees right now. There's Biden and Trump. Um, regardless of if you like, if you, and I'm throwing this out there, so, but regardless of if you like one or the other, is it better to vote for, as we've talked about, the lesser of two evils or not vote and then potentially end up with the same thing that you have now? I'm, I'm- I'm sorry. I look at it as I, I, I'm sorry. I'm look, I'm looking at this. I'm, this is Larnell. Can you hear me, Angela? Oh, it's Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. To to go off what uh, Andre and Destiny were saying. Wait, one. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. All right. To piggyback off of what Andre and our Destiny were saying about this agenda, I think the agenda has always been there. Like Destiny said, back in 1972, agendas have been created. It's, the fact is, when we have an agenda, we don't stick to it. It gets taken away from us. 
for whatever reasons, either we don't stick stick to it or, you know, it gets watered down and uh, we just go on to the next one, to the next incident. And like Andre was saying, in a couple of weeks, this is going to die down and uh, there, there's going to be more incidents and we're going to keep crying and, and fighting and fighting and fighting. What I do agree with at this point in time where we are right now, this one seems a little bit different, you know, and, and I, I like that it's different. And I'm praying, hoping and praying that this difference is going to continue. So we're not in two weeks, in a week, whenever the next one occurs, that we're still having the same, like we're going back to square one and then fighting again. And um, again, like I said, this is different. This is a different. Now, what, what, what Angela was saying as far as um, uh, voting, the way I'm voting I'm voting right now. I think it's imperative that, that that we cannot get four more years of Trump. And I, I know people don't agree with 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 um, everything that Biden is saying, but we'll never agree with anything that one candidate says. But right now, I'm looking to the future. What's happening right now is going to affect our grandkids, their grandkids, their kids, their kids. On down, we're talking about generations from now. The things are being turned back to where this MAGA thing. To me, MAGA means getting us back to that time when we couldn't look people in the eye, when we had to put our heads down when we walked by certain people. We couldn't drink out of the water fountain. You know, everything was really separated based on race. And as far as this, uh, there's a lot of static. Hi. Um, okay, there you go. To mute. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Now, um, with police brutality, this is nothing new. Right. We all know that police brutality, this is nothing new. I was in, on the Waukegan Police Force for 23 years, and I can call back there now. Again, this, this is nothing new, so we, we need strategy. There's a, um, a website. It's called 8 Can't Wait. The number 8 Can't Wait. You guys need to check it out. It, it breaks everything down from the police community as to what we need to do to get changes within the police community. And um, again, it's like Destiny said, we need to educate ourselves and we need to come at this thing from an educational from a, and from a strategic standpoint. You know, back, back in Waukegan, in North Chicago and Zion, people need to educate themselves on how chiefs become chiefs, the power that we have, the power that we need to use to make these changes within these police departments. There's just so many things that we don't know that happen within the police departments that we have the power to change. And it's way past time for all this stuff to change because I'm tired of waking up every morning, you know, seeing that somebody was killed by a police officer, that somebody was beat up by a police officer, that somebody was in prison by a police officer, you know, for 30, 40 years. And then they get out, they throw a couple million dollars at them and then the problem goes away. Who was arrested for that, that person going to prison for the rest of their, all that time? Nobody, no police officers, no judges, no attorneys, nobody is found at fault for the criminal behavior that they do. So there, there are solutions. We just have to get together and, and make this stuff work. As tragic as, as uh, George Floyd's death was, we can't let it go in vain. There was a, there was down here in Arizona, the same, that morning before George Floyd was killed, there was another brother that was killed, Dion Johnson. He was killed by the state police. No video. We just got to take the police word. So at this point in my life, I don't take what they say face value like that. We can't afford to because we've been, it's been proven that they have lied so much that we can't take stuff at face value. Um, think, now, what, go ahead. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Patricia, can you go ahead and make the statement that you put in the chat? Yeah, so we were talking about uh, voting earlier, and um, I completely agree. We're not always going to um, believe what all of you know all the politicians say. We're not going to always agree with it. Um, but I, I made that mistake four years ago. I did not vote in the presidential election, um, you know, because I didn't really care for Clinton either, um, and. Look what happened and I regret it. I regret it dearly. And, you know, now I just, I know that, you know, what my one vote probably wouldn't have mattered, but I wasn't the only one. I know I wasn't the only one that did this. 
I wasn't the only one to make the, that mistake of, you know what? I don't believe Clinton. I don't believe she's going to do anything. She lies, whatever, whatever. But then look what happened. So I, and I, I fear that that's going to happen again. I really do because as much as we want to, um, like Destiny had said, demand things out of Biden and, and all of that. And we should, um, if people decide, you know what, I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to vote for him. He's not automatically going to get the black vote. He's not automatically going to get the Hispanic vote and people don't vote for him. What, what, what's going to happen? Trump's going to get reelected again. And, and um, I don't know if I can handle that <laughs> another four years in a row. But she, I do want to say what wait wait one quick quick thing, Andre. Um, I do want to say one thing. I I'm a huge advocate of voting. I people have died. I I voted since I could. I'm 18. I'm out there. I got to vote. My first presidential election was Obama's election. So I think this. So this is my my whole point about this. I think when you vote when you vote in a presidential election, you know you're voting for senators. You're voting for propositions. You're voting for so much. It's not just when you go and make your ballot, it's not just the president. I mean, that's like the high mighty, but there's so many other people. We need to be voting. Think about if we had a whole Senate that was whatever, that was aligned with the values that we're trying to do. We had a house that aligned with the values that we're trying to do. That means Congress, even if we had Trump, we have a Congress that aligns to what we're trying to do. So they're going to block him at every turn. He's only going to get through with executive orders, which is probably how he got through with most of his stuff, to be honest. On top of that, or are we voting for our mayors? Are we voting for our DAs? Are we voting for the people, like our chief of police? We have the right to vote for that. And if we don't educate ourselves on what we can actually vote for and how we can make those people align, with think about how better our would be if we knew, hey, our chief of police is actually behind us and he aligns with what we're trying to do. You know what I'm saying? Our DA is behind us and he's aligning with our trying, what we're trying to do. I think it would just make so much easier. It's not, it, even though the presidential election is like the big cojones of all of it, because the figurehead is the president, it, it, it trickles down and we have to um, educate ourselves on all the levels, not just on the top. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. Andre, go ahead. So I just wanted to chime in and ask, as far as like, Kim was saying something in the chat about um, uh, voting locally. You know, voting locally and voting federally, two totally different things. But see, I don't see, I think people have a short memory, like, you know, going back to the constitution test and, and back in school, we learned about voting and stuff like that. You know, you know, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Al Gore won the popular vote. The electoral college ultimately chooses who the president is gonna be y'all. So I'm saying with the vote, you know, you can outnumber the votes, you can vote, in record numbers, if the Electoral College decide they don't want to put that person in, they're not going to do it. So at the end of the day, how much is your vote really worth? Your vote is worth I, more at the local level I agree. than it is at the national level. And that's who, that's who controls the police. It's the mayors, it's the city council, it's the commissions that are set up. That's why one of the first things they took out of the schools was civics. When you understand your civic responsibility, when you understand that even when the Constitution of the United States of America, the opening statement in the Bill of Rights is all men are created equal. How could you write that and you own slaves? George we Washington owned slaves. All these folks who wrote this stuff, and wait, the only wait. way that they could write that and, and own slaves is to devalue the Black man. And so when you understand that your vote at the national level, and that's why they have the electoral college. Because remember, even then, slaves were counted as one third of, the, of a person. So the Southern states would have controlled the presidency for hundreds of years, all the way up until now, probably, if they had not had the electoral college, because that's how Abraham Lincoln got elected. Mm -hmm. So we've got to understand the historical context and know that our votes count more. We control more at the local level more so than anything. And like the young lady said, if we get a democratically controlled Congress and House of Representatives, even if President Trump gets reelected, our agenda can still be pressed forth. Mm -hmm. wow. Did not Obama have the House and the Senate in 08? He had the House and the city and Senate in 08, and that's how we got health care, which was not on the top of the Black agenda. Black vote helped put Obama in office, but he wasn't, that we weren't the principal people to put him there. It was big money and corporations that put him there. Mm. And that's who he owed his, his allegiance to. We voted for him because he was black, not anything right. that he said. He could have said, correct. yeah, 
she would have all been screaming and going nuts. I'm sorry, I low key just to be just to clarify, I voted for Obama because I wanted to stay on my parents' health insurance until I was 26 years of age because your girl didn't have it. So that is one of the reasons why I voted for him. It wasn't just because he was black. I did look at his agenda to see what he could do for me. I did educate myself on that. So I just wanted to clarify, it wasn't just because he was black. I, he was the better of, of, of what was happening and what was going on. Okay, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna do generalizations, um, but understanding that there probably were quite a few black people that voted for the first black president because right. he was black, so. Right. <laughs> So um, good conversation, you all. So, so knowing that, um, if you're thinking about, and I'm just sticking with the voting part right now, but knowing, knowing that about, oh, sorry. Okay, so knowing that, knowing that, and I like what Bishop Hargett said in terms of starting locally, does that change for anyone who may not vote who or who, has said they're going to vote for the person they want to vote for when that person gets there. How do we get that person there if we don't start somewhere? So if we start locally, how do we do that? And how do we educate um, younger people? Because I feel like the millennials are like, like Des Destiny, Andre, Aja, all millennials kind of sort of in different age ranges. Like if I'm talking about just those three, but with in that group, there is the group that's like, I'm not doing this because I've seen posts where it's like, well, I don't want to vote for Biden. And I'm saying Biden right now, but I don't want to vote for Biden um, because he's got issues. And then we know, you know, and then the issues with Trump, even locally, like in Waukegan, Zion and North Chicago, North Chicago. we have three black, we have three black mayors. Is, is there any change that you all are seeing in those areas for those of you that are local to us? No, I'm gonna be yeah, honest with you. About... They have such, they have such a. I, I I think I've gotten in more arguments on social media with people from my own community than I did from people from my what's outside of it, and it's because the mindset there is just so. I can't even describe it. I I, I see. I think that we should have. We should have. I don't even. I don't even know. I just don't think that they're they're doing what needs to be done. Think about North Chicago, generally. I mean, I mean, I don't live there anymore, but think about North Chicago in, in just in reference. North Chicago has no grocery store. It, it, it can be self-sufficient. Every My grandfather who was in North Chicago literally has to go outside of North Chicago to get food. Like, why is that not a priority? Why is it not priority to, to build within? It's like a wasteland there. It, it, it has gotten worse. The education in North mm -hmm. Chicago. My mom made me go to Waukegan so I could be part of the college studies program just wow. because she, I couldn't, and I lived across the street from North Chicago High School, right mm. across. Mm. And I had to go to a whole different school just to have a better chance of getting mm. into college. I, why is this not, why is this not a priority? I go to, I, I'm an avid reader. I go to the library. I hated going to North Chicago Library. Why? They didn't have books. How are you a library? You don't even have books. Why are these things not addressed? So I don't think they're, I, I mean, as much as I love um, the mayor, because I think he's a sweet person. My mom worked in for the city. I don't think he's doing the job to actually build us up. <laughs> I don't think that, you know, and I'm just talking personally from like my experience with in North Chicago, but yeah, what are you doing? Why are these things not addressed? Why are they just going on and being perpetuated? You don't even have any businesses who want to come into North Chicago. <laughs> so, you know. So, I want to hear from some people that haven't spoken yet. Because obviously, all of this is in passion. Like, we really have a passion for all of this across the board. But I want to hear from everybody. Like, the conversation that we're having, it is a hard conversation, but I want to make sure that everybody is has an opportunity to share their thoughts and participate. Angela, can I share something? Um, you know, I um, I grew up um, in spending my summers in Puerto Rico with my grandparents. And um, my grandfather was so passionate about the importance of voting that that's why I vote because he, he his passion, he, he um, passed it on to me. And that's why I, I get so passionate about what's going on. And, and, and I try to push, you know, not push, but educate my children and anyone around me to do the same. So I think that's one thing that we need to do too. 
um, you know, those of us who maybe are older or even the younger, if you're, um, you know, voting, educate the ones around you as to why, because so many people think that it doesn't matter and it really does. Um, and being in, in Puerto Rico is a very, when it's election time, it's crazy. They're so, um, and they're divided by, you know, um, parties and they're just so the emotions. Um, but that taught me to be like, you know what, it's not about party, but look at who the person is. And it is said that all of our local elections are so undervoted because people don't realize how, the importance of it. It really does matter. Um, I know, for example, when, um, just as an example, our school, school board in Waukegan, um, you know, how many people did their research on who they were voting for? I know there was right. one person on the board at one time, and I think she got in because her last name, her surname was Spanish. And she was horrible. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that shows that people didn't learn, you know, learn about these candidates, ask the right. questions. Um, I mean, I know a lot of politicians and I will, you know, I will ask them the tough questions or, and I will give them their, my opinion. And, you know, it, it's really important to have that dialogue. And one more thing I want to say is, you know, I, I, I want to, okay. when, when I go out, yeah, people look at me and they think, you know, she's a white lady and I'm not, I'm his, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm, I'm Hispanic, but I see it. And it scares me for my family members who, who don't look like me. Um, you know, my husband looks like he's um, from um, one of the Arabian countries and he's Puerto Rican. So it does scare me for family members and friends. And, and um, you know, we, we definitely do have to stay united and, and try to find solutions. Thank you, Wanda. Anyone else? Kim, you've been very quiet. Kim Norland. I did because I'm trying to come over that way, but I'm sorry. Um, well, I guess for me to talk about the voting and how important it is, recently everyone, so our mayor um, here in New Orleans is a Black woman, but recently we've kind of seen how she backs the police above all else. And um, right now she's bragging about the city of New Orleans and our police force and how um, they've been so peaceful with like the protesters and how they're so great. But Wednesday night they fired tear gas into our protest claiming that we were being violent with them. I was there. Every time we approached police like barricades, we put our hands up and we said, don't shoot. And then they let three of the leaders through to talk to the police officers. And they said, look, here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going. Please escort us, like walk with us. Like, you know, last night you made this big gesture. You took a knee with us on the interstate and it made the news and people were like, oh, look at New Orleans, they're doing so great. But it was a stunt because then the following night you do the same thing and here you are and you tear gas everybody. And then people were saying that people were throwing rocks, not through, no one, was put hands on anyone, no one threw things like, and so, and then Mayor got on NBC yesterday and was bragging about the police and like, and then said by the protests were turning violent. And, you know, it just like, we kind of saw the true colors of you want to say that you're like allowing these peaceful protests and you're like, we welcome you. We we hear you. We hear. I'm ready. Um, but then we see the exact opposite in action. So, um, so yeah. So to me, it's just really important mm. to, to vote. And I and I've been one of the people um, who has always been hesitant to vote if I don't like, like either candidate. And I think it's important, as everyone else has you know said, to do the research and really vote on a local level and know because that's where the change is going to have to come. So. Okay, that's good. Anyone else? Kim Woods, you've been po you've been posting things. You want to share some things? No, I'm just I'm I'm enjoying the conversation. Um, I just think that I think we're all agreeing with the fact that voting is important. 
I think now it's just become like a um, a slogan kind of. Everybody is like, yay, get out and vote. And then I even find myself some days um, when it's time to vote, it's like, eh, <laughs> you know. And 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 um, I think Wanda's absolutely correct. I know I do. I you know I'm gonna say what I do and whether people think that is wrong, but I vote for names too, y'all. I'm sorry because there's sometimes I go and it's like a million <laughs> names on that form, and if I see somebody named Jamal or uh, <laughs> or something like, I'm like, well, let me vote for Jamal. <laughs> 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 black you know whatever sanitary person or so or it might be her name may be margaret and it might be you know margaret versus john you know and i at that point i might say let me vote for margaret because you know we, we need a woman there so we're all guilty of that and if you're latino you might see somebody you know the last name hernandez you're gonna vote for hernandez you don't know who he is you just know he's latino and you feel like he need to be on the school board. So I totally agree. I think that um, this is even right. giving me a lesson to even research before I go to the poll. So I think what we need to do as people who are pushing the agenda of voting, don't just tell people to register to vote. Don't just push people to register them to vote, but also kind of push who the people are that's running. Um, start supporting these, um, Right. Um, events that they have where people can actually come and sit down and and uh, uh, forums where they you can ask them questions and they you can find out who they are. Start demanding that we know who these people are. Just not put your name on a on a list, you know, because your name is Frederick Douglass. Everybody gonna vote for you on the thing because you got a name, <laughs> you know, that everybody so George's name is George Washington. <laughs> so we are gonna vote for George Washington. So. I just think that we, as we're, as I'm watching the marching and I'm watching all of these things playing to effect, I was shaking my head when we were saying voting because it's not so much about Biden and Trump. You, when you vote on a local level, you're voting for judges. You're voting for those people that actually are putting the brothers who you marching about in prison. You know, they're, they're setting those 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 um, terms and things like that for them to go. So you got black people and, and Latino people and color people. We have got to learn that your power is who is your representation. It is who represents you and it is who, you know, you go and you sign your name and say, I want you to speak for me. So that's basically, you know, all I had to say with that, with the voting part. And the census, please push the census because when it comes time for for um, money to go to the city mm, and when it comes time that. for buildings to be made and roads to be built and sanitation and all of that, they look at census. You know, they look at how many black people live in Waukee. You talking about you got a black issue and you only represent, you know, 30% and we all know it's more than that. So you need to get the census back. You need to get those numbers back in so they can look at those things. So that was my two cents. Andrea, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you, I just wanna have um, Cynthia and Patrick say something because I know they have to leave because they have another meeting at 11. Okay. And I saw Cynthia post something. So do you both wanna weigh in really quick and then Andrea, I'll come to you. Yeah, so I, I think Andrea was the one, I see a cell phone that posted how important it is to go to city council meetings. I will tell you, we go and it's, generally the same four or five people that attend. And I realize I have to consider our demographics that probably people are working or people have um, other issues that they're worrying about going, but then you don't know about your cities. You, you're not able to vote in um, instances that you can vote to say, wait a minute, you're spending how much money on what? <laughs> You know, and so I, I do believe it's very important to get involved, to be in your city, to know who your city people are. Yeah, we have a black mayor and, you know, we have conversations mm -hmm. with our mayor. And so that, that's one thing I think that's um, very important. There's one other point that I want to bring up and hopefully I can come back in and, and, and talk about it because a lot of people reached out to me. And one of the things someone asked is what about, it's good that we're talking about Floyd, but what about all the other um, black and brown, black people that have yes. died from yes. this, um, 
that, that have been murdered, you know, they talked about um, Breonna Taylor, right? They brought her help and that her um, say her name. And so is that going to be a part of our plan that we advocate that we start bringing all these other people that have been murdered to the forefront as well? Because we, you know, George Ford name is going ahead and we're so thankful for that. But we, we need to not let everybody else's names get lost in that so we can get justice for them as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, sure. and I guess, I think I'll, Patrick, oh, Patrick. Oh, sorry. and I guess I'll chime in as well. Um, so you know, thank you everyone that 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 came, and thank you Angela for doing this, um, setting this up. Um, to to Andre, you know, I I I totally get your point. Understand of of having closed closed conversations, and yes, those could be fruitful, but but then you also lose a perspective that okay, yes, here's the plan, here's the agenda, we got it. But maybe you're, maybe you're, you're gonna miss a perspective, of, okay, how do we introduce this in, into legislation? Because um, you know, one thing, and I, I've been guilty of it myself, is you know, when you talk about racism in our country and, um, and, and throughout, the, throughout all the states, you know, people go back on the 13th Amendment. You know, we, all men are created equal, we've been given freedom by the 13th Amendment. But look at each state's constitution. Each state has a separate constitution. You know, more specifically, when you get back into the history of, you know, the Civil War and in, in, in that time, the Southern states specifically put in their constitutions that African Americans were, were, were still not equal. They were still not, not, not people of of equal value. Um, and then you know, fast forward to you know, the mass incarceration era where, you know, you have, the, you have the, these, these issues that come up in certain populations, certain communities. And, and at this point, it, it, these are targeted towards the African-American communities, Hispanic communities, certain trends start popping up. And now legislation puts in and introduces, okay, well, this particular drug, which is a derivative of the same drug, and, and I'm specifically speaking of crack cocaine versus cocaine. So laws, the federal level, mandated mandatory sentencing mm. for crack cocaine, not not cocaine in general, but crack cocaine and crack because crack cocaine was so much cheaper, that That's definitely crazy. targeted and marginalized different communities. So when you talk about judges and voting at the local level, there's still issues there that that are not going to be overcome overnight. It's going to be it's a long road and a long process. Um, because those judges are ultimately stripped of their power, they're stripped of their impartial decisions because they have a, they have a mandate. They have to put down the sentence. I have to send this guy away for this, this small, this small wow. rock of, of crack versus this guy who's coming in and got caught with a kilo of cocaine in his trunk. You know, I have to send the, the crack cocaine guy away for, for 15, 20 years versus this guy with the key. I can only, I can send him away for five. Because I That's now the judge wow. has that he has that decision power because of the difference. So, you know, it, I guess all that to say it's it's a long process. And while I I do agree with with some conversations need to be had within your own communities, but I mean to be honest, guys, I mean when we're having this conversation, you're talking about getting you know a group of white people together in Gurney or in Libertyville or in Vernon Hills by themselves, honestly, nothing's going to change. <laughs> I agree nothing's with that. Because then they're not going to have that perspective. They may come with the full intent. We need to make change. We need to treat everybody with equity and, and, and see justice is served fairly. But then they don't know how to do it. They don't know from what perspective that it looks like we're treating people with equity. They may come up with language and fancy bills and laws and introduce it into legislature but if it doesn't look and feel like okay we you know the black community finally got our voices heard we're finally getting new legislation but if it doesn't feel like that then it's really it's not fruitful um so you know while i while i do agree you also have to be careful with some of some of those conversations as well because you don't want to come in and everybody's on fire and wants to do a good thing but then you're walking away and like you know, what really changed. Some Sundays I'm guilty of it by going to church. I'm on fire. I want to go to church and hear the word. And then I walk out. Okay, I'm not, nothing changed. 
Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of make sure you're getting all of the perspectives, all of the different views to really make sure change is effective and and will be will be pursued. This is good conversation. Okay, Andre, I'm coming back to you. And those of you that haven't spoken, I'm coming to you next. Okay. Um, so basically, I think that, you know, the local vote is effective. It can be effective. But I also think that, like, like you just said, great point. Like you just said, you know, voting alone is not enough. Because look at Waukegan, for instance. You know, there is no wonder that all of these gaming centers popped up. All of a sudden. All of a sudden. All, why is that? Is because the licensors bought off the aldermen. They, they run the city. Not only do they have their own individual structures, they're in, they're in gas stations, they're in restaurants, they're everywhere. How do they, how do, they do it? It, took, it takes money. So my point is that maybe along with the vote, instead of just voting and, and posting your sticker on Facebook, maybe we should send some campaign donations. <laughs> I have been guilty maybe, of that. <laughs> maybe, maybe, we need, maybe we need to vet our, the, the people better. And maybe we need to send them donations. Because guess what? That's why all these gaming centers are there, because they sent them donations, campaign donations. So I'm saying voting alone is not, is not going to get our, our, uh, any resolve. We have to vote, and we have to send checks as well. Lots of checks. It's, lots of money. it's, it's called action. Yeah. It's called action. Hmm. Right? It's called action and, and, and being strategic and a part of the agenda and everything, because you're 100% right, because that stuff didn't just pop up overnight that stuff has been in the works for years and years and years you know mm -hmm. um as i put in the chat waukegan zion north chicago a multitude of black public officials and, and what's changing waukegan started re remember that old movie um it's a wonderful life <laughs> waukegan to me looks like um uh what is it pottersville that's what waukegan looks like to me every time i come back to waukegan i, I literally I, I i get sick you know, flying into Chicago, flying into Milwaukee. It, it could be the brightest day in the summer. I just all get out. I get into Waukegan, I physically get sick. So my goal is to get in, into Waukegan and get out of there as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Because it, it looks dingy, it looks gray. I see the same people walking up and down the street doing the mm -hmm. same thing. I don't mm -hmm. see any changes happening in Waukegan. The other day I had a conversation, um, it was on Facebook. I get into it on Facebook with a lot of people. And I had to, <laughs> I, I had to delete. A lot of those guys I used to work with I had to delete them because mm. they just pissed me off with the stuff that they say they're, they're inhuman in their thought process. So you can't tell me that the thought process that you have, you're going to go out on the streets as a police officer and be fair and impartial. It, it, it doesn't work that way. So the other day I had a conversation with one of the aldermen in Waukegan. This was about the abortion clinic. And this is not for or against abortion. He's telling me that the abortion clinic just snuck into town. How in God's green earth mm -hmm. is a business like that sneaking in the town? That's the, that's he, that's what he said. I, so I, I'm like, I'm done talking to you. You, you. you make absolutely no sense. And if it's snuck in town, you guys on that board, the mayor, the alderman, and I, I mean from A to Z, you guys are doing your job if an abortion clinic can sneak in the town. So you're telling me <laughs> all this stuff, this sneak, all this detrimental stuff, this sneak, this supposedly sneaking in the town, stuff that's going to affect us most. And I'm talking about us as black people. I had another lady telling me, another elected official, telling me that gambling is going to change everything in Waukegan, the money that it's going to bring in. We ain't getting none of that money. We're going to have jobs at the gambling casino, but we're going to be in the back sweeping the floors. We're going to be the ones parking the cars. We're going to be the ones working it in the... Um, in the restaurants, but we're not going to be the ones making the decisions. All that gambling money, all that stuff is just criminal. It's criminal and it's inhumane. So all this detrimental stuff that we put up with, we allow it to happen because we don't vote locally. When these jokers, and I'm being nice, get into office, we, we, we don't hold them to the fire. Right. They have addresses. They have email addresses. They have houses. They have phone numbers. We should be on the phone every day, bombarding them. And if it's time for them to get reelected, we go down the list, check, start checking them off. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. No, you're not getting our vote. And we and, and okay. it, it, it can't be just vote. OK, we vote for them because they're black. That's one thing. Once they're in office, what are you doing? If you're not doing what you promised to do, you need to go. No ifs, ands, buts about it. And it's not a personal thing. This is straight business. 
It's time for you to get your butt up out of that seat and it's time for you to go. All these black organizations that we have, the NAACP, the Urban League, you know, the CDC, everything. We got all these organizations, but here we are on a Saturday morning having this conversation about police brutality in 2020. Why? Because we're not holding people accountable and we're not using the power that we have. July 7th, or I, I believe it's July 7th, there's an organization, um, they're doing a blackout. They're asking black people not to spend any money. If you have to spend money, spend it only with black organizations. That's a fantastic idea because we spend trillions and trillions of dollars a year. And we, we and they know we're gonna where we all this stuff is is calculated. They know where we spend our money. They know who we give our money to. It doesn't circulate in the black community. They know this stuff. I like to shoot. I like to shoot guns. I'm by. I'm He's by licensed of, to do that. <laughs> yeah, I am. I like to, and, I, and I like to. It's fun to me. But the problem is, it's. I'm trying to find black people to spend my money with. Because mm -hmm. I, what I found is a lot of these gun companies, these companies, they're pro-Trump, which is fine. But when, when, when you have somebody that tells you exactly who they are, you got to believe them. And so these, these gun corporate, these gun groups, there was one group that I was buying from, you know, religiously. And um, when Trump had made that, that comment about grabbing by the private parts of women, they used <laughs> that as a coupon code to get 15% off. <laughs> I wrote them. I wrote them a letter. I sent them an email. This is the last time you get a nickel from me, because it's obvious what? you don't respect everybody's. And you you got to research who you spend your money with, because this stuff is out there. And it, it it's they they don't respect us. They don't respect us. You know. And there's a reason why there's a liquor store on every corner. Like Andre was saying, right next to that place, it's got that new gambling place in there. Well, I came back to Waukegan years ago. I went to Patestas. I walk in there, I see this swinging door. I asked some of the guys, I was like, what is that? They said, that's the gambling spot. I'm like, what gambling spot? This is a family restaurant. Right. I'm like, wow. So we allow this stuff to happen. Right. Yeah. Katrina, I'm coming to you. <laughs> I don't know, and I have... Um, I'm sitting here with so many thoughts, you know, as a, my cousin was killed um, 17 years ago by the police in Waukegan. My husband is a police officer. I work for DHS. So I'm, I've worked for corrections. So I've seen this from across the board. I've seen it from every, every place I've, I've heard. I've heard every platform. I've heard every every excuse and I don't know there's no we say vote and I I'm a firm believer of voting I've voted ever since I was able to vote and I've never missed an election even when I worked in correction it was in a different city I was still a registered voter in Zion I and because corrections gave you that time to off to go vote I would leave where I was drive two hours just to come to Zion, just to make sure that my, my vote counted. So I believe in voting. I also believe in holding people accountable. If you don't hold people's feet to the fire, then they can give you whatever agenda they want to in the beginning and change it anytime they want to because no one's holding them accountable. But I also believe that we as black and brown, we have to put ourselves in position to be somebody on the ballot. We have to put ourselves in a position to be educators. Mm -hmm. We have to put our position. We have to put ourselves in position to be judges and lawyers and police, because we have to know. And you know, my husband, he's he's a black officer, and he's big on. You know, he became a police officer so that he can can police his community. He hates that in Zion. Most of the police officers live across the border in Kenosha because they don't want to police where they live. Wow. And so <laughs> it is, it's hard to, I don't, it's hard to express the, all the, the emotions and the thoughts that's going on in my mind, because my biggest thing is if we're not at the table making the decisions, then we're on the table being the decision. And so mm. I just, 
mm. that there's so much more as a people we need to do. And now I totally agree that within our community, we have to make the change. We have to be the change. We can't expect outsiders to come in and try to change, you know, the, our, the way we do things the way, but I do believe too that we can't limit it now within the community, of course, but when you're talking about making global changes or you're talking about making, you know, these huge changes, you need everybody because, you know, even though my husband is a police officer and, you know, people have say whatever they want to about police, he's, he is the only, in his department, he's the only black in authority. He fights racism every day. Every day I got to hear what so-and-so did and why so-and-so did this every day. So don't think that because, you know, there's black police, they don't face racism too, because they do. However, he he's not one to, to hold his tongue. So he's quick to call people to the carpet, you know, and sometimes his mouth because he, he has um, called people to the carpet, his chief or whatever, um, and reported things, you know, there's been some, some backlash, retaliation or whatever, but it doesn't stop him from doing his job. And, and he's not, you know, he just got his 20 years. So he, you know, he's like, at this point, they do whatever, say whatever, because I can retire and take, take my pension and go to another department. But my whole point is we have to be better. You know, working at DHS, mm -hmm. it, uh, it amazes me how many people don't even have a basic GED. And when it's, mm. when it's free and we offer it and you don't do it or, you know, and be, especially mm -hmm. when they apply for cash, you have to report daily or weekly your activity. Well, when you show me you're not going to school, then, and then you're mad when I cut your benefits, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't want you to punch a clock. I want you to get your GED. Let's, let's move this barrier out the way so that we can attack mm -hmm. these other hurdles. And, and that, that is something at DHS I have struggled with. How do we get our people to do better? You know, my grandparents raised me, and they only had a 10th grade education. So... And and I went to college, and they took me to college, and I never took out a loan. I never had scholarships. Please they paid God. me to go. So I just I don't understand how do we change the mindset and the mentality of our own people. We have to learn to respect ourselves first. We have to learn to love ourselves first. And I'm and I I know that racism exists. It exists in corporate America. It exists on federal levels, government levels. Mm -hmm. You know, working for the state of Illinois, I've experienced racism too. But I also know that, but I put myself in position so that when you have in these meetings, guess who at the meeting? Me. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to mm -hmm. hold a meeting without me. You know, I met, you know I, when I first got to, when I left corrections and came to DHS, there was no union steward. How is there no union steward? Oh, okay, you got one now. So now every time you hold a meeting, you have to involve me. I have to be at those meetings. Mm -hmm. So I put myself in positions that you're not going to make a decision. Even my husband, our kids went up until this coming year, they've gone to private school. But he sat on the board at, at Zion because his thing was, when they get ready to go to Zion, I need things to have already changed. I can't get on the board right when they get there. I need to make preparations now. And that's the things that we don't do. We don't put ourselves in position to be the change or to make the change. We need to be the ones on the ballot. So from there, where do we start? Do we start in the school system to educate our kids so as they get older, they're already prepared? Or do we just go straight for government officials and we attack them and then hope that you know our kids see it and that it will trickle down so they become under the understanding of what to do as they get older? Who do we start with? Are you asking me that, Aja? Well, in general, but you can you can go ahead first if you like. Because I believe we can't just wait for our kids, right? 
I mean, granted, they have to be educated because, I mean, even, you know, I'm, I'm like your mom, I'm a Gen X, and, and I don't know, y'all millennials think a little different from us. And so the the <laughs> movement, the movement is different, right? And it's gonna be different when our kids get get older. So educating them now is important. But there are people now that we need to to encourage, we need to put in place. I tell my husband all the time, you you need to go sit on somebody, you need to go be on somebody's ticket besides the school board. And he has sat, you know, he, he, he was the first black president of Zion School Board. He, he has sat on Zion's Police and Fire Commission. He puts, he's another one that puts himself in place to make the decisions so that decisions aren't being made for him. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, our kids have to be educated. Uh, you know, my, now my husband, we have two girls, so he'll say all the time. I don't ever want you to be a police officer, but if that's what you choose to do, that's what I support you to do. And that, you know, and that's only just because, you know, the mm -hmm. other day I'm up mm -hmm. all night because at that point there were threats. Any police they seen shots fired. So I'm up all night because he didn't got caught out because of all the, the looting and the rioting. And I need him to come home just like I want my cousins to come home. Like I want my uncles to come home. Like I want, any black man to come home or it, any person because human life and people want to say that if you kill by the police is different it's there is no difference if you ask a mother who has lost a kid whether they were killed by a gang member or the police you think they care about who killed them they want they they child back so you know my i'm always pray, praying and keeping him covered because it it could be somebody else. It could be the police. He's been he's been um um profiled out of uniform. You know, I tell him all the time, you'll target twice, whether you got a badge on or not. Cause when when it comes down to it, you still a black man. So we have to educate our children, yes, but we also need to be we need to be ready now. We need to start preparing people now to take to take their rightful mm -hmm. place in our community. I think you brought up a great point there about your your husband being targeted twice. I, I feel that you know, even with my son, I feel that way deeply on both sides. You 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 have to be careful when you engage with the police, and then you turn around, you have to be engaged when you are engaged with, with your peers because you don't know who's gonna pull out a gun. You don't know the, the, our young people today are dealing with a lot complicated mm -hmm. thing you know we had the three young men in zion that went to go shoot another young man over a facebook fight you know it's 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 as our young people today are dealing with with um the differences and not just racism but the things and the problems that we that we deal with from within our community and just the violence from within and i think that we've got to approach this in a way that that we value life across the board, not just when a police officer kills a black person, but when a black person mm -hmm. kills a black person, we've got to show the same concern and outrage that we would if they were killed by the police. I forgot it. Okay, so there's a question, and I think it's somewhat been answered, but I'm gonna ask it, there's a question on Facebook. It says, what can we do to have our own people to do better and get involved? I do believe it's a lot of education. I'm just not sure where we start. Like, I agree it can't just be on the little ones because the older ones have to be um, I, educated. I, I, think the greatest I think the greatest equalizer in America is capitalism. When, when we invest in companies, when we invest and when we teach our children the power of the dollar, the power of compound interest, the power of the hot market, when we teach mm. that, because when you invest in a company, they don't see your, you, you as a black or white person, they see that dollar. And when you get your dividends back, if your white counterpart invested a dollar and you invested a dollar, both of you get the same dividends from the success of that company. You will lose your money just the same if the company fails. The greatest equalizer, and I think that's what we missed in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, is we didn't teach our young people about the stock market. Like Trump, dislike Trump. Yes, I agree with that. 
The stock market is rolling at 2700 I looked at my 401k. I can't wait to turn 57 because I'm retiring. I'm <laughs> You know, and if the stock market takes a crash, then I may have to work so right. The greatest equalizer that we can have in our community is capitalism. And when we began to control our own economic destiny, oh my God, things can change. Then we can build the infrastructure within our communities that we need. Black folks are the only people I know that live in a community where there are no hospitals, there are no supermarkets, and we don't control the schools. Come on, yes. Well, we control those three mm -hmm. aspects of our community all through economics nothing can stop us absolutely nothing <sighs> no political candidate will get up there and say well if you don't vote for me you ain't black well i don't have to vote for you because guess what we're going to be able to find our own political candidates that we want to put up because we have the economic structure to do it economics is what we have to teach our children mm -hmm. macro and microeconomics and my son right now at 11 years old I set him up with a little stock market thing and he's and he thinks it's a video game. He Come thinks he's playing videos. But guess what? He's investing. And I'm teaching him he's how to do it. We're doing it together. And that's how we're gonna succeed. Put our children on a stock market, thinking not yeah. strange. As soon as marijuana became legal and it started to be sold, the very people who cultivated it, that sold it, that marketed it, that made it popular can't get involved in it. Go downtown Chicago. All the people with the dispensaries, they don't look like us. But we were the mm -hmm. ones who marketed in our community for years. And now I don't have an entryway into it? Come on, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. So if you won't let me own the dispensaries, I'll own the company that owns the dispensaries. And all of that, all of that is fantastic. I agree with everything that, uh, is it Bishop? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree with everything the bishop's saying, but the thing is, is that we got to remember, we used to do that stuff. Remember in Oklahoma, there was Black Wall Street. In Florida, you know, all over the country, we had these enclaves, enclaves rather, of us doing everything the bishop said. And what happened to these places? They didn't, they didn't disappear because we didn't continue. They disappeared because people did not want us to succeed. Exactly. So, so generational wealth has been taken away from us. So it's that we're, we're, we're going uphill on a slippery slope to get back where we were before. Because imagine coming out of slavery and starting something just like Bishop said. I mean, successful millionaires. Yes. yes. I mean, all over. There were Black people. Destiny just gave me a book that I'm reading. But I had known about other Black millionaires that came out of slavery mm -hmm. and did all of these things that Bishop is, is saying. But the point is, it's just like it's a battle on every front. And I mean every front. And so we get back to having our own, having Black Wall Street, where, the, where our dollars is circulating for three years in our community before it goes outside of the community. Then we have to think about the next step. How are we going to keep this going? You know, then we think about the next step. We got to add security to all of this stuff. So it, it's, it, to me, it's, it's just always, it's, it seems like it's defeating from the beginning, and I know it isn't because I'm not one to believe that everything is hopeless. But um, man, we got to be strategic on every level because we don't want to succeed yeah, and then yeah. have that success taken away from us again, like it was in the past. So collectively, we come up with these ideas, but we got to think to the future because I, I look at it like um, like Bishop was saying, we get to that point. You know, I make it. Am I reaching back to pull somebody else up? Am I teaching that person to pull the next person up? So we take this generationally again, where we're not just stuck in the current situation where I made it today. So you got to get yours, which is selfish. So that's what I was going to say. So I, I too agree with everything Bishop Hargis said. And I think what I'm challenged with is uh, the president sends out stimulus checks. And then soon after we open up, and then what are those stimulus checks being spent on? Is it being spent on rent for some? Yes. Is it being spent on bills for some? Yes. But how many people were running to go get the Jordans, the new Jordans? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost like, a, a, it's just a systematic effect in terms of, I'm gonna give you the money and then I'm gonna give it, then I want you to give it back to me. That's, that's really how I feel. The second thing is for, for me, it's like, I go back to the same question, where do we start? Because if Katrina's in DHS and she's trying to get 
um, people to just get their GED. Like it is a mindset. How do we go about changing that mindset? I mean, and that's really what it's about. I, I can say that, you know, I have probably been guilty and with two of my three, well, I think all three children on here um, of giving them what I didn't have when they were younger. So, you know, and so there comes this, you know, some are, have been spoiled, some are not, but it's just like, and then they do it with theirs. It's like, how do we break that now? It's like you have, but, but I will say all three of my children have a great work ethic. So they know how to get it for themselves. So with that, how do we build that within everybody that they go out that they understand like what their dollar really is worth. You know what? My personal opinion is I think it goes back to value. I think we don't value who we are as a people sometimes. And then we don't understand the value or the wealth that we, um, <clears throat> our, our, our spending power. If you go back and look at statistics that um, I think it's the, um, the agents, their their dollar, they, they go back and invest in their community. That dollar stays in the community like 19 days. You go look at the Latinos, it stays in their community six days. You look at the Jewish people, it stays in their community between 18 to 15 days. When they did a statistic on the black community, it stayed between six hours and less than 24 hours. Ooh. So we're taking a lot of our money and, and our wealth and we're invested in other people in other communities i really think one of the problems is we need to invest in ourselves uh we need to we me and destiny talk we need to find we and i and i haven't really i'm kind of guilty of that but we need to invest more in the black businesses we need to start building up our community doing what we need to do and of course i don't think that's the only answer i also think when it comes to being accountability we need to start holding people accountable a lot of times i think um uh, somebody will say something and uh, we'll allow them to say it, but after they get in office and come back to the vote, we won't hold them accountable for what they said or what they've done, but then we complain and we'll vote them back in, but we won't hold them accountable. So I really think a lot has to do with accountability. And I, I, that, that really started bothering me yesterday when I saw that uh, man from Buffalo Grove when the police, a 75 year old, a white man, they came up, they pushed him down and he bumped his head and he started bleeding. And I, and I started looking at the natural reaction, you know what I mean? Th th there was, first of all, when you see a person in that position, your human reaction should be, what can I do to help this person? So out of 57 policemen, it was only one that was actually going to help that person. And even that one that was trying to help the person, the other one stopped them from helping that person and all 57 of them continued to move on. And then to top it off to make it even worse, and this is what I'm talking about accountability is when they filed a police report, they said the man tripped. So not only did they lie about what happened is they knew that they could get away with it because they wasn't going to be held accountable for it. So once they found out that the TV camera actually filmed the incident and that they were that the two got suspended and they were going to be held accountable for it, the other 57 in the union all resigned, standing in unity. And my point comes back to we have to get to the point where we stand in, in unity. There's a lot of division among us. And I know a lot of that may have triggered down for slavery, but we have to get to the point where we stand unified and do what we need to do as a unit. We, if, we, if we had a buying power of $1.1 trillion, we have some power. We just don't realize the value that we have. Um, and, and, and I'm going back to when they, when um, Coca-Cola had a problem with racism and Jesse Jackson, stood, Jesse Jackson stood up and he said, look, it ain't no joke, we don't drink Coke. When he put his foot down and everybody united and everybody said, look, we not gonna be buying any more Coke products. We not gonna be supporting Coke anymore. Stuff changed automatically. And that's what I'm saying. When we find that there are people where there's problem, we need to unite and attack that problem and hold those people accountable. That's one of the way things have changed. Well, what are you going to say, Andre? No, I, I wanted to say just quickly, be careful when they say that they resigned. They didn't resign their position. Yes. They resigned on the rapid response team. They didn't quit. They just said, okay, I won't be on a the rapid. They're still on the force. They're right. still getting right. paid. And the right. two that got suspended were put on administrative leave. Do, let, let, let's really pay close attention to the narrative that these, nobody's being held accountable. Right. No, they, 
it, it, it'll get swept under the rug. And the same Coke went right back to their ways of doing business as soon as everything calmed down. But when you invest and we own 51% of Coke, then we can go in and fire everybody. But my, my point, and I got what you said, and I'm 100% with that, but my point is when I say hold them to the fire, accountability is just not for one day, for one week, for two days. That's for a lifetime. We need to keep checking it out and keep holding those people accountable. And then I, I think my last thing, I'll just say this before I go. It's amazing to me that the standards, whether it be in the Black community, the police community, are so different. If you were a citizen and you falsified a report and you went before, you'll be looking at some time as far as jail consideration. But yet here I am a cop, I can falsify a report knowing that I'm not gonna be held accountable and just get away with it. That's where I change, I changes I believe we need to start the community. It needs to be accountability. We need to go back and start investing in black businesses. We need to be aware of our buying power and stop thinking that we're poor, we're poor, we're poor. If you got, if you your spending power is 1.1 trillion, I guarantee if you stop buying Nike tennis shoes, you're gonna get Nike's attention. If you stop buying Adidas stuff, you're gonna get Adidas stuff. And, and back to what you say about the stock market, I 100% agree that. But the problem with us with the stock market, most of us have not been taught to invest in the stock market. So basically, we don't know what we're doing. So I also believe in that in that area, we need to be trained. We need to have somebody to say, hey, look, you can be done. And, and the stock market, I've done it a, 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 a few years ago. It's not as hard. It's a matter of doing research. And the problem is sometimes we don't want to do that is that research. But now there are all a lot of companies because of the way things are progress that can do a lot of research for you that will save you a whole bunch of time and help give you uh, the information that you need to invest in certain companies. But I'm with you 100% on there. Those are just some of the things that I feel that needs to be done. But I'm, I'm going to go back to this and I'm finished and say what Lionel said, that uh, faith without works is dead. It don't make sense for us to have a conversation unless we decide to unite and do something and get something started. And everything needs to start in a little step. We, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You don't have to try to take the whole elephant and eat it. You just got to start off with one bite at a time. And that's the same way we need to do. We need to find the issues. We need to find one thing and we need to start addressing. And all of us don't have to be involved in resolving the same issue. One person can work on one issue. Somebody else can work on another issue. But we all need to be united when it comes to fighting that issue. That's all I got to say. And it okay, requires I want to hear from, we have, we have a few people that haven't spoken at all, so I want to make sure that I hear everybody's voice. So Freddie, um, Lenora, Liana, if you all can just uh, weigh in, and then Destiny, I see your hand, I'll get to you. Okay, I think Freddie, me personally, uh, is Freddie Oh, okay. Uh, I think for me personally, like it came when it came to like education and stuff. Like I feel like a lot of people, especially in my generation, like no one from college um, perspective that a lot of them don't know. And I feel like, especially when it came to worth ethic, like I feel like a lot of things are just handed down to them or like handed to like, I'm not saying like their life is just easier, but I feel like they're just not as receptive to change or like having an open mindset and they're like ex expectations and values are at a certain place so there's like when it comes to me and like some issues or like things that I um addressed it's easier or like easier for me to see stuff than I feel like some of my peers and I think for us it's just more so like the education and also like the parental investment because sometimes I feel like um parents not like necessarily mine at all but like some parents take <laughs> <laughs> oh but like parents don't really take the time to like sit down and teach them and that shows especially when they go off on their own like they don't know anything so it's just like they get caught up in that same mindset and they just add to the cycle that's already been de so detrimental and I feel like that cycle needs to start changing with the generation above us so like our generation we need to change the like generation below us and then the generation above us needs to help with ours because I feel like it's really getting passed down from generation to generation and nothing's going to change if that mindset continues so I feel like having a uh, organized and like having it where like we're coming together and like really teaching and being proactive about it and really having people on the same page would also help but I think 
it's tough, especially when you're like 20, trying to change your mindset at that point. Because like one thing for BSU, we always teach like racism is taught, like when you're first born or anything with any of that, like you, they don't, like kids really don't see color. And they've done like multiple experiments on it. And even then, like you see it all the time, like kids don't see color. So it's just more of a mindset and it's taught. So I feel like that's why it's really important for people to understand that you need to get ahead of it. And I feel like a lot of people just try to block it out of what their kids are trying to do because they don't want them to see the bad parts of life and try to make everything rainbows and sunshine. But it's really important to start having these conversations early, to start teaching your kids early. And I think because when they get to my age and they're already like in the world or something happens before, like you tell them, then that starts making it harder for them to like reciprocate or understand. And it also makes it so that they just get back to book put back into the same mindset so I just feel like because you know a lot of things especially with money like we really like like we like Jordan we like having like name brand stuff we have a very name brand generation and that's where a lot of money goes and I feel like um for us I don't feel like they understand what it means to invest in themselves to like start a business and stuff because they don't have anybody really to teach them or tell them like hey you can be a CEO like they're mostly like okay you need to go get a job like you need to work so I feel like having a more CEO and having that mind sorry sorry oh, okay <laughs> sorry so I think that's really important that to like encourage them to like do more and having those conversations early and stuff before it's too late okay Lenora Hi, I'm um, sorry I stepped, I will be stepping away taking care of my mom. So if I missed a lot of um, comments that may have been um, said and I'm repeating, I apologize. But um, one of the thoughts that I do have is for, uh, in regards to the voting. Um, I always thought, I always think that if you're not going to be a part of the voting in the system, whatever reason you have, if it's, you feel like nothing's being done. And we, we've been talking about that earlier, how important it is to really look at our local levels versus just the top level. I feel like you shouldn't say, you don't have anything to say, really. You should just keep quiet because your you're voting to me is saying, I'm trying to make some change here and I'm trying to you know, really understand the history of how we even got to even voting. Women didn't even have an opportunity to vote as well. But take that seriously to the point if you're gonna be vocal about change and any kind of incidents that's going on and you know, situations that are going on, be quiet if you didn't vote, you know, to be honest, but you know, that doesn't always happen. People who don't vote, they always are the loudest ones. Um, and then another thing about really, really understanding unity. Um, I even think about in the Bible when um, the, 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 um, the Tower of Babylon, that was so unified. You can be even unified for negative. I know that, but it's power and unity. And if we can get all on the same page, you know, I thought about, you know, people would ask questions. I would see comments coming up. Do we need a a spokesperson like Martin Luther King or how Malcolm X or even Farrakhan led the Billion Man March. People are asking, do we need someone like a Moses to help us through this, to be the spokesperson, to represent us at the top level, be the one to go into the White House to talk and do the marches like Martin Luther King do? And you're thinking, mm, I don't know, I don't think so. But if we're unified with the same mission, the same goal, that's strength, that's power, especially if it's positive, you know, hopefully those of us who are believers and, and, and Christian faith, hopefully we all are, are walking in that direction of truth and that we are trying to make a change in our, in our local levels and our government, how our police officers are handling because I don't want to lose the police officers. I thought about it. I thought about the movie Purge. Oh my God, if, if any of them go on strike and don't want to even help us anymore, we are in trouble. So I think about those things, you know, and I just praying for the unity of the people, we're, all of us even on this call together, that we all be on the same page, wh whatever we're gonna do, whether it's to march, whether it's to um, talk to the level, the, the senates and the um, representatives of our, our community, even to the higher levels of the president, that we just be unified because there is power in numbers, you guys. So that was just my two cents. Thank you. And then Freddie? Freddie? You're on mute. You hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, I, was, I was just saying, I wanted to go back to 
what Andre was talking about and having like the, the separate meetings and stuff like that because I feel like, and just being honest, I've had to block and unfriend more black people recently than anybody else because it's just so many people talking about Black Lives Matter is a lie and discrimination don't exist, police brutality is a lie. And it's like, if we can't all get on the same page, how we, how, we, how can we move forward the way we need to? It, it, it irritates me, especially when people bring up the, what about black on black crime? As a person who has been for a long time, been in the streets trying to fight this problem and trying to, and trying to bring out about a change in that area. I don't need to hear from people who ain't spent a second out there with me trying to tell me what about this or what about that. Because where were you at when we were out there? You weren't there, but you want to get on Facebook and talk about what, what about black on black crime. I don't want to hear that right now. That's not even the subject we're speaking on. We got one thing we're trying to deal with, which is in, in this instance, police brutality. If you're out there marching for that, march for that. Don't bring up nothing else. But if we can't stay focused on what we're doing, if, if we're going to have separate things where you're going to deal with this issue, deal with this issue, deal with that issue, okay. We, if you're in that lane, deal with that. But you can't come in and, and step up to me while I'm trying to march about one thing and you, you're going to try to deflect to something else while we're trying to get something accomplished right here. That's not going to help the situation. So I, I don't have time for people being ignorant and, and all this other stuff. I don't have time for that right now because my focus is on moving us forward. And there is a lot of, lot of different ways that we have to tackle that and have to move forward. But if we're going to be united, we have to be united on what we're fighting for and what we're trying to accomplish moving forward. And then we have to start to educate ourselves. It's not, I, I, I agree with, all, with everything everybody said on voting and we got to make sure we got the right people in position, but then we also have to educate ourselves on the laws, on the different things that make these things possible. We have to educate ourselves on qualified immunity. We have to educate ourselves on these things. So when we go, go to the city councils or whatever we go to, we're educated and we know what we're talking about. So they can't just tell us anything they want to tell us and we just go along with it because it sounds good. We have to make sure that we're well prepared to fight the fight that we're trying to fight. That's just a little bit of my thought. Okay, thank you. Destiny, I have some things I want to add, but I want to get to you and Andre because you had your hands up. Well, let me lower my hand. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, no, I just was want to comment on some of the things that were being said um, throughout the conversation when um, they were talking about um, Jap uh, Jewish communities and, you know, Hispanic communities and things of that sort. I just wanted to know that you guys, I just wanted to let it be known, like, did you guys ever see that, that thing that's going around social media right now, which is about reparations in the United States of America and how the United States of America has really paid everyone else except for Black people? For what was happening and going on in, the, in our country, like so many people have gotten rep they Ger Germany's given reparations to to uh, to Jewish people. You, um, the U.S. has even given reparations to Jewish people. They've given reparations to uh, many Indian tribes. They've given re uh, reparations to Japanese Americans because if you did not know that they were also doing what they're doing to the Hispanic community, which is having those camps to Japanese Americans, so they they paid them reparations. The reason why people are so successful in this country is because they, they people right that wrong and they gave them money to start those businesses that they had. Generational wealth was, um, so I think when we talk about generational wealth, we also have to think about what's stopping us from, from the, um, getting that and being able to produce it down. Um, and then another thing that I saw was um, also just holding people accountable. So by, um, who are, entrepreneurs to, to buy black as well. So what I was telling our Angela before when we were having a conversation is think about when you go to somebody who has a t-shirt line, this is a black owned company, they have a t-shirt line, right? You have to make sure that the black owned t-shirt line or wherever they're getting their t-shirts from is black owned. You have to make sure that whoever they're getting their press from is who get, or who are pressing the, the um, logos or whatever on their t-shirt is black owned. Where is the black, where is that pressing page people getting their supplies from we it has to trickle down because it, that's how it stays in um i don't know if you guys watch killer mike documentary it's a it's an interesting show but it's an interesting show i've only the only watched a couple of episodes but the first episode was he tried to live black for what 20 what a week i think it was a week and it was impossible for him to do because he would go to a restaurant he would eat food and then he'd be like well wait 
where did you get your food from? And they would outsource it from somewhere else. Like, are we, we have to talk about black farming, black agriculture. And like, I think it's just such a broader conversation that there's opportunities for us to get involved in and to actually create a, a narrative within different spaces. And then I also want to talk about gentrification and how that's blocking people actually buying up the block. Think about even communities that already have black owned, um, black owned businesses and have like, for instance, I'm gonna put it in Inglewood. Inglewood is a huge community, black owned, has most a lot of black owned businesses, but you know what they're doing? They're about to make the stadium in Inglewood for the um, Chargers, the Chargers stadium coming to Inglewood. So what are people doing? The white people are coming into Inglewood, buying up the businesses there. And now it's, it's, long, it's no longer, buy, they're, they're taking up all the space in the retail space. And not only that, but they're pushing people out because now Inglewood's becoming this hot commodity real estate, all these things, they're pushing people who are already based in that community out because they can no longer afford to stay there. So I think this is just, you know, I just wanted to put that to your attention and say like it's a broader conversation that we need to focus all of our things on when we even talk about entrepreneurship business. Like my dad said, we have to combat racism within all these different aspects, redlining. There's just so much involved that we need to think about when we're thinking strategically. So I just wanted to put that on everybody's mental that it, it's a broader, it's broader conversation. Thank you, Destiny. Andre, you've been patiently waiting. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're, You're muted. muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, I just want to uh, make three points. I'm going to be kind of be as quick and concise as I can. So the first thing, um, so there's a term that, you know, millennials use, some of us who are in the know, we talk about being on code. Being on code, what does that mean? Y'all, we have to, black people have to develop a code of conduct, okay? And it should kind of be like our own personal constitution amongst our people. We don't have a code um, and we need one very badly because that, because that from there you can talk about organizing. We can't, we can't, we can't organize. We have, so, we have a bunch of different agendas within the same team. We have to work as a team. We have to be a unit. <clears throat> uh, young lady was talking about, you know, maybe we need a leader. Maybe we need somebody charismatic. We had that, we got that today. The code should be the leader. What, what happens is when leaders die, when they get shot, they get arrested or whatever, trumped up charges, the movement dissolves. So I think the code that we develop should be the leader and everybody should follow the code and we move as one. I, lo I love ants. Ants have different agendas, but they have the same agenda, but they have different components of their colony. Second point, um, <clears throat> this is subjective. I don't necessarily want to unify with all black people. Why is that? I say that because if we do develop a code of contact, code of conduct and have an agenda, somebody who's a black conservative might just try to block it with all of their might. You know, they might try to, you know, uh, slap it down in Congress or whatever. So I think we need to be careful about this word unity <clears throat> because I think we need to vet people who are really gonna be on our team and really be for us when we really need them. So I'll move on to my third and final point, which is, um, cause I, these are all solutions. I'm trying to come up with solutions. The third and final point is, you know, um, police unions and police oversight. You know, the reason that these police are so strong is because their union is strong. So my thing is how can we, you know, get some checks and balances uh, on the table about these police unions who, who, who protect bad cops? I think that's a legitimate question. Um, and that's, that's all I'm done. Hello? We heard you. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that so going, back to, good. going back to what Andre was just saying <laughs> about his last point, about unions, police unions and everything, it, 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 it all goes back to money and power. And they have the power to lobby us and everything to, put, to push their agenda forward. And we see that it's working very, very well. Mm-hmm. But don't but don't the police fund their fund their unions? Yes, they do. And you, we, you and we fund the police, right? We supposedly. I mean, it, it's all about money because um the thing is with unions, let's say something happens in let's say New Hampshire, and a police officer does this, that, or the other, and the union success, successfully defends him or her, they get the job back, they get back pay, they don't get punished or whatever. It, it's a ripple effect. Because it's going to happen in, in, in whatever that little piece of whatever they did in New Hampshire, a union in California is going to hear about it because they go to national conventions, they have 
just like we're talking here, unions have meetings and it's just like everything. And they, this is successful for us. So it's going to be successful for somebody else. So let's put this out there. And so the thing that happens is, and I don't think the general public realizes that when these, um, um, when these payouts go, that that's not money coming from the police department. That's money coming from the taxpayers. So one thing I want to look at is, is a police budget. Let's say Chicago's police budget is, you know, $8 billion. Okay. And Chicago is paying out $1 billion in, 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 in damages, you know, for wrongful uh, lawsuits and everything. Okay. So next year, Chicago's budget, Chicago police budget is going to be down two or three billion dollars because you're paying out money for wrongful lawsuits. So we need to start attacking the police departments where it hurts them in their pockets. Individual police officers, they need to get sued when this stuff happens and not have the union and the citizens paying money for their wrongdoings. All of this stuff, pensions need to be taken away when they get in trouble like that. And, and the unions do a very, very good job of protecting these officers. And I mean, extremely good job. They've been doing it for years. It is a well-oiled machine and they fight to the death to make sure that it keeps going. Just like I said earlier, re reaching back and pulling somebody up, they do that all the time, all the time. They have schools that they send these union stewards and these union presidents to so that they uh, can learn how to do this stuff. So we got to be very, very uh, strategic with this stuff. Extremely. Um, I just wanted to add to um, kind of what we're talking about as far as um, unity and what needs to be done. I guess I'm, you know, and I don't know who else, everybody is, is, is positive and, you know, saying what we have to do and, you know, coming together and all of the things, but, you know, I'm, I'm really tired of hearing about that. I, I don't, I don't think I'm the only person. I'm tired of hearing about what we have to do. I mean, it's the same thing and, you know, I'm a comedian, so yeah, I'm going to give the comic relief. It's the same thing about diet. You already know what you're supposed to do. You, you, you don't need 20,000 people telling you to eat a balanced meal and to work out. We all know that. We all know we ain't supposed to be going to McDonald's all, the, all day long and Burger King and all of that, but we're still going to do it because we're human. So in my opinion, I think we need to concentrate on things that we know we can be unified to do. It's more than just black people that's out there marching. It's a lot of people that's out there marching. Watching a cop put his knee on the neck of a black man for eight and a half minutes is wrong in everybody's book. That's something everybody agrees on. Even on Fox News, they agree with that. Even Orange Nixon agrees with that. I'm sorry, President of the United States. He <laughs> agrees with that. So to say that, you know, I understand, I understand the brothers, I understand y'all anger, trust me. We get it. As Black women, we support y'all. We understand. We understand what it's... We don't know what it's like to be a Black man, but we understand. And we have compassion because a lot of us are, you know, moms of Black men. So that compassion is going to be there as women who raise Black men. But we don't know what it's like to be a Black man in this country. We, we're not going to pretend like we do. We don't know what it's like to get in the, go in the building and have a white person step off an elevator when you're getting ready to get on. We don't know what that's like because we, we don't have that same experience that you guys have. So we get it. But let's, like Reggie said, the, how you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. So let's just concentrate right now. If we can just do that on the one thing we all agree on, and that is you don't put your knee on someone's neck for eight and a half minutes to show that you have power. So while we're all unified, all colors, all races, all uh, groups, let's look at that problem. And that is police force, how they use force against citizens, of the United States of America and how we can change that. I agree with Andre. These other points, I really think those gotta be in the living room with black people behind closed doors. Th those issues that we are talking about, that has to come with black people talking to black people and why we don't all agree on, on the best way to do it. We have black people who are different religions. We have black people who don't respect 
somebody who's a Christian because we'll say, oh, that's a white man's religion they threw on you. So you got a white man's Bible. So it, it, those are conversations we got to have behind closed doors. But let's con right now, let's just agree that police brutality is wrong and how we need to fix that. And y'all, I don't know if any of y'all feel like y'all had the answer. I really don't know. Because like you guys were talking about, you have unions, you got money, you got years and years and years of, 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 um, of, uh, of something that has been set into place. You're talking about cops having to turn against cops. You talking about people with skeletons in their closets that got to come out. Y'all, that's a big, it's a big thing to tackle. But if we can at least start to nibble at it and at least work on that as a whole, as all races, I think that that will help the black community <laughs> because they won't be just pulling y'all out of cars anymore like they're doing. So I, that's just my two cents. Okay, Katrina has a comment. Go ahead, Katrina. So I was just, you know, I was listening, and when we talk about about unions and what they what they do or what they don't do, right? First of all, unions drive a lot of our economics. It drives the it drives the minimum wage. So we have to be careful when we talk about unions and dismantling unions and things like that. We also have to be careful because unions will only or their job their purpose is only to protect the rights of the employee and those are labor laws or whatever type of um, um policies that you may have within your organization now i can guarantee that this officer that put his knee, his knee on george floyd's neck the union will see they're, they're going to talk to him, right? Because he has that, that right. But I can guarantee you they're not going to waste money defending him. And most unions won't defend in courts of law anyway. They, they, have, they do have attorneys for that, but I can guarantee you they're not going to waste money when he's already guilty. He's not even going to go to trial. Let's, let's be honest. He's, he's going to ask for a bench trial. So he's not even going to go before a jury. So we just have to be careful when we talk about, because all of unions play a big role in economics. We have to be careful when we talk about, you know, conservatives versus liberals. You know, I consider myself a, a democratic conservative because I, I still have Christian values. But I also b believe in, in, in my work ethic. I believe in unions. So, we, you know, there's just as you said, Angie, in the beginning, I have learned not to, to focus on one particular political group because they all lie. And most of the times you're, you're choosing the best of the, the two evils because they all lie. They all have an agenda. They all going to change their agenda. You know, it's whatever it is to get the vote. And then once you start feeling pressure from somewhere else, you're going to change it to meet that pressure and meet that demand. So we, we have to be mindful of, of the powers that we do have, right? And, and use those powers. I'll, I'll tell you, even though I believe in the union, there's a lot of things I disagree with the unions when it comes to politics, because most most of your unions, besides FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, will um, they're they're all democratic. They're going to vote democratic across the board. They're going to encourage you to vote democratic across the board. FOP tends to be different only because of the um, the right to bear arms. So you know we we have to know who who the enemy is, and not and not all police are bad. You know, I tell people all the time, I remember my husband had, we had six flags and he defended this, this young black guy, this young black, uh, he, I don't know, he was a teenager, but defended him from Gurney police. And for the longest, Gurney shunned him. I mean, for the long, so, you know, there's, there's injustices everywhere and it's not just in our police department. So we have to, we have to tackle the injustice as a whole 
And when I say we have to keep, hold people accountable, that's our policy. That's even our own. I, you know, I tell my kids all the time, I can hold your feet to the fire because if I don't, you're going to think it's okay. Behavior uh, not addressed is behavior condoned. Mm -hmm. So it's across the board. Even within our own community, we have to hold each other accountable. And that's how we're going to get the change that, that we need. You know, I, I'm, I'm all for the protesting, but walking up and down the street all day, it might get somebody's attention that's driving down the street, but we need to be at tables. We need to be having discussions with people that's in office already, that's making laws so that we can get stuff changed. We need to be able to sit down with people and say, hey, help me put this bill together. I want it to go before Congress. You know, I've already reached out to, to Brad Schneider, our U.S. rep, because I he's he's good at hosting town hall meetings. Well, guess what? Now we we want, now I'm calling one. Mm -hmm. And 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 those the same people that protest and needs to show up for these town hall meetings because I've gone to school board meetings, I've gone to city hall meetings, and you know who show up? Nobody. And then when mm -hmm. things are changed, the laws are are changed, then you're the first one crying. That's right. So thank you, Katrina. So this is what I want to say. So we are six minutes out. Um, the conver this conversation, the focus is the pandemic of racism. And I want to thank everybody that has participated. You have all come up with some, well, we wanted to start off with where people were at um, because we knew we weren't going to have a solution today. But I think that um, I agree with just about everything that's been said. I think that the biggest thing though is if we push the racism issue off the table, then we're back to where we started, if that makes sense. Um, so I want, I, I guess, go. yes, I think pr police brutality is horrible. I think my biggest issue right now is that it's happening consistently, but why did it take George Floyd for it to happen? Why didn't it happen when Trayvon Martin why didn't it happen with Tamir Rice, who was only 12? Like, why is this the issue? So I guess I don't want to deal with, yes, we need to deal with police brutality. I'm trying to figure out how to say this the right way. But I want to figure out how we can move forward in a positive direction, understanding that it's not going to be easy. Because yes, we need to deal with police brutality. Yes, we need to be at the tables. I agree with all of that. But I don't, what I don't understand is why it took this time for everybody and their mother to be out protesting, to be out doing all this stuff when all of this, uh, <laughs> Kim, I just saw your post, when, it, um, when all this, this stuff has been consistently happening. It, it struck a chord with me every time, but the Brianna thing messed me up. I'm like, the woman was in her bed. She was asleep in her bed. And her, I don't know, it was her boyfriend or husband who had a legal firearm when they thought they were being broken into, he goes to jail. Like that stuff really ticks me off. And I'm like, I guess this is my protest. This is my enough is enough. So going forward, I wanna hear where everybody's at, but I really, really wanna focus on solutions because at the end of the day, I don't want this to die here. I don't. I don't want, you know, George Floyd, he gets, you know, buried and then, you know, and Brianna, and then we stop hearing all of this stuff. And then we go back to being complacent and then it happens again. I don't want that anymore. So I want to, you have anything you want to say? Okay. <laughs> so I want to say thank you all for coming on. I think it was very, very important. Yes, I agree, Lenora, out of sight, out of mind. I think that, it, and George Floyd was, but a lot was of, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, um, I want to continue. Like I want to do this. I want to do this through the end of June. So every Saturday this time, I'm hoping that you all will be available. But going forward, I really want to wait. I don't want to say it like I haven't appreciated what's been said. I do because I think we needed to hear everybody out. But I really want us, at least this conversation for me is about what's the next steps. So what are we going to do? If we're going to deal with police brutality, I'm good with that. But I also want to deal with how we can 
start making changes within ourselves, within our children, within our peers, within our generational groups, whatever that looks like, because we have to start. And just to say, this is all we're going to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we have people on from California and from uh, Arizona. It's a little early for them. So we can talk offline about changing the time, destiny. <laughs> But um, yeah, but I really want to focus on how, what we can do, whatever that small thing is. I don't know what it is, but that's where I really want to to focus. Are you guys okay with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. We are going to jump off because it is well. It's eleven fifty eight. Are there? I'm sorry. Are there any questions or other comments before we leave? Thank you to everybody who's on Facebook as well. We so appreciate you listening in We um, and all the comments and please feel free to come back. We'll let you know when that next time is. Uh, it'll be next Saturday. We just got to figure out the time, but any questions, comments or anything from the panel or anyone else here? Last thought. <laughs> okay, hey, if, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sorry, Bishop. No, I was just going to say, everyone be blessed, and thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate all the diverse opinions and ideas, and I think this is a great first start, and I look forward to seeing everyone again next week. Okay, thank, thank you, Bishop. You. Everybody else, have a fantabulous day. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. And this was the hard conversation. <laughs> sure.